All right, I'm sure there will be a few more people joining us, but we are two past the hour and we are going to get started. So welcome everyone to EBCO's Executive Book Club. Today we are covering, covering Think Again, The Power of Knowing What You Don't Know. And I am hoping that you all found this book just as inspiring and as exciting as we did here on the EBCO team. And for those of you who are just joining us for the first time, you are joining our most popular EBCO initiative. We actually recently had an EBCO open house, which was wildly successful also. Um, but today you are on a tried and true experience. Our book club has been going on for going on five years now, which is absolutely fantastic. We have covered all sorts of topics, everything from the future of technology to clean beauty and wellness. And we have people from all sorts of disciplines, those of you in research and development, people who are focused on the front end of innovation and pipeline development. We have marketing and global insights team. And it is our hope that you find inspiration for innovation and invaluable insights for the future as you and your teams tackle all sorts of issues. All right, who is EBCO? For those of you who are new, welcome, welcome. We're a trend-powered innovation firm. We see signals and patterns and all sorts of inputs and fractals out there in the world. And we are pulling them together constantly and triangulating that information and turning them into new possibilities for our clients. And as you can see here, we work in a range of industries, so many exciting and inspiring teams across all sorts of categories each and every day. And I'm going to turn it over to Kaylin real quick to talk to why our latest pick was <laughs> Think Again by Adam Grant. Yeah, well, I'd love to hear in the chat if you really enjoy the book. Um, if you haven't read it yet, we're going to go over a lot of the top content, so no worries. But I'd love to hear in the, book, um, the chat what you thought about the book overall. I, when I saw the book title, I was really intrigued because I thought that's a lot of times our projects at the front end of innovation start with this concept of we don't know what we don't know. So we're going to like start the research. We're going to start this innovation process and we're not sure what we're going to uncover, but we're going to be really comfortable in the fact that we don't know what we don't know. And so when I read that title, I was like, the power of knowing what you don't know. I was like, wow. I'm like, that's something that we talk about all the time. And so I found, you know, we kind of, I did base a book off of its cover and <laughs> get it from there. But then I found, wow, Adam Grant is such a great writer such great content. Um, so we're really excited to dive into this because I'm sure so many of us have heard, we've tried that before. We've done this already. That idea didn't work last time we tried it or um, leadership has no appetite for that. I mean, how many times have we heard some of those common sentiments? And I think we're getting into an age where rethinking and realizing that there's some like awesome humility and not knowing everything. There's just a lot of power in that and a lot of power for innovation. Um, and also the world changes, like we're in this cyclical cycle of constant change and how many, I guess, like former conventions of society have just broken in the past two years has been pretty insane. Um, the rate of change that has happened. Um, so it's led us to have more humility and thinking that we don't know everything and that things can change um, faster than we think. So we'll talk about a lot of that today, but would love to hear kind of your early reactions to the book um, in the chat as we get started. Yeah, that's great perspective. And as we get started, one other one other thing to note is in EBCO's programs that we work on with clients, sometimes we will dig right into something that is very clear. Other hey. times a client will come to us exactly what Kaylin just said. Hey, we don't know what we don't know. We don't even know where we need to be looking. And those types of challenges really force us to do exactly what Adam Grant digs into big time here, which is rethinking that powerful ability to connect dots in new ways. And, and here, this is the perfect slide right here and why this matters. It's this ability to take that mental pliability, a willingness to open our minds, push aside long held assumptions. And this can be about where our category is headed or how consumers might evolve in using and experiencing our product and being able to rethink it and being okay with that. And sometimes that offers, or I'm sorry, sometimes that requires a brand new perspective, a team of people who are willing to look at something different. And the future, like Kaylin said, is constantly changing and preparing for it by rethinking as he digs into deep in this book is a way that we can think about how our category might take shape in a way that we hadn't previously thought about. So love this book for so many reasons. 
rethinking is a skill set, but it's also a mindset. We already have many of the mental tools we need. We just have to remember to get them out of the shed and remove the rust. And that is what we do all the time. And when our clients come on board with us, they're doing it too. And this is what keeps us pumped and motivated. Yeah. And just to throw in something else, we did an aging book club, uh, I think about a couple months, probably six or so months ago. And it was really interesting because one of the things that keeps you young is to form new pathways um, and get neurons firing in different ways, which is by doing different things that require the brain to relearn or re, you know, do something new, essentially like going rollerblading. If you haven't been rollerblading for 30 years or learning how to do a new hobby, like woodworking. And so I thought there was this interesting connection with like rethinking about this idea of like, how do you keep your brain pliable enough that you don't become I like to say this, I'm always like, I'm not an old dog that knows no new tricks. Like I'm open to changing my mind um, on things. And you can like try to convince me because um, I feel like I, I want to stay open as I get older and I don't want to get ingrained in my belief system. So I feel like there's something interesting, like, and also this correlation with aging and how we tend to be more of who we are as we get older. But that also sometimes is the opposite of being pliable and being um, more diverse in our thinking and more open to new ideas. So we'll definitely cover some of that as well. But the aging book that we had um, in our past book club is a great one to like tie into this one as well. Absolutely. So turning over into the book now, what we're going to cover today, first we'll dig into individual rethinking, think like a scientist and beat the overconfidence cycle. And as we discussed today, you'll see that not only are we turning the camera onto ourselves or the mic, the, what do you say? The, the, telescope. Oh, blah, blah, blah. my brain scrambled, but looking at ourselves, going deep and thinking about ourselves, but we're also looking at our organizations, the long held belief of the teams and the culture that we work in and what they're telling us about how we should think or how we should run our programs. We're also going to dig into rethinking your category. So a few new innovation stories and thinking about future forecasting, and then also rethinking at your organization. All right. Part one, individual rethinking. Think like a scientist and beat the overconfidence cycle. The most annoying things people say, instead of rethinking, tell us in the chat which one you are familiar with. That's the way we've always done it. That will never work here. That's not what my experience has shown. So very much so looking backwards, or that's too complicated. Let's not overthink it. Let's not try something new. What have you experienced here? I'm sure, okay, I see some people saying all of the above. Yes, all of the above. Sometimes when people come to us and we are all working together, this is the start, this is the impetus for it. Hey, I really need you to come in and be that outside voice because everyone is telling telling me we can't do it or it's not how we do it here or we've never seen that work. And so that is definitely an uphill battle for some of the people that we work with and we can resonate with that. And that is why maybe passing this book around to your organization could be highly beneficial to your efforts. Uh, there was a LinkedIn post that went viral that said, that's the way we've always done it is like the nail in the coffin for most companies that are legacy companies because it's a sign that the organization hasn't changed enough in their thinking to be able to evolve with the future segment or the consumer that they're going after, or, you know, assuming we're talking about products or consumer innovation, it's, it's a sign that, um, that the thinking might just be too process-based and not open enough to what could change as the world has evolved and as the category has changed. So I, I even like thinking of, I mean, retail strategies have changed so much. We've seen this influx of direct to consumer brands, We've seen new ways to monetize and get products to market that we haven't seen in, in historically. And so it's just required like more agility to realize that you might lose money in the short term, but long term, it's going to keep the business healthier or it's going to allow for success. So um, really interesting. Some of the ones that you're saying that it's too much theory. That's too well, okay. um, it's against the standards, um, which that sounds like maybe more of a process thing. Um, or it's too complicated, bugs somebody the most. Yeah, I think definitely some of these are, are triggering, right? In terms of maybe what we've heard before or what we've experienced. So in terms of the rethinking mindset, we wanted to focus on some of the big ones that came out of the book, but really this theme of thinking like a scientist. So thinking more like a scientist, changing our thinking in the face of sharper logic and stronger data 
So I thought it was interesting that there's kind of this creative bend to innovation, but also he talks a lot about scientists, which typically use data to tweak um, their results um, and thinking about not being kind of married to your beliefs or not just thinking that you had the best idea um, and you're passionate about that, but there's really no evidence um, that you're allowing to change your viewpoint. When we accept that ideas are not ideology, we bring in an invaluable sense of flexibility into our thinking. So he talks about three modes of thought that typically don't utilize rethinking. So the first one is prosecutor mode. So this mode is where you're trying to win a case and prove others wrong. Um, so if you change, if you feel if you change your mind or amend an argument, it could be admitting defeat. Um, like you might experience with a prosecutor trying to win a case. They're never gonna admit there's any flaws in their case or that their client could be guilty, right? It's always, how do you prove flaws in the other um, point of view that you're seeing? Um, for preacher mode, this is delivering sermons that protect and promote a precious ideal or idealism or ideology. Um, so this for some companies could be like culture based. It could be that we always do it this way or this is the way that we want to do it here. Um, and just kind of making it really um, in this ideology viewpoint and that to change would kind of indicate some kind of moral weakness or a weakness in thinking. And then politician mode. So this is kind of the people pleasing mindset but trying to, you know, a lot of times we know that collaboration is so important, but are we like overly kind of agreeing to things or kind of watering down ideas? And so this is the idea of people that flip-flop, teams that flip-flop, they never challenge ideas. And we'll talk about a Pixar example later that we thought was so interesting because they really believe in this idea of argument um, and having creative arguments that allow for better ideas. And if you think of their most popular movie lately, Turning Red, which, you know, there is a lot of pushback they got on that movie because it's about preteen girls. It has, it, it features periods and menstruation. Um, and it also has some of those awkward moments that you go through as a teenager and then also has immigrants in Canada. And so there was a lot of focus of how is this a mass market movie? Like who is going to watch this? Like, how is this going to resonate if we're talking about preteen girls? Like who's going to watch it? And, you know, they really were able to bring kind of this more nuanced thinking by, having creative tension, having creative arguments, um, and going into a niche that, you know, other movie companies would not think is very profitable. Um, and they've been wildly successful. Um, I have a five and a three-year-old, both boys, and they love that movie. And so it just kind of goes to show like rethinking and being open to new types of ideas. Um, you often find great success in it. And Pixar has been an example of that throughout the years. So with these in mind, I know sometimes it's hard to turn and look at ourselves or our organization um, if you want to keep this to yourself, but I'd be curious for a little self-reflection. Maybe this was you in the past. You found yourself slipping into one of these types, one of these modes of thought. If you're comfortable sharing in the chat, maybe you used to be more of a prosecutor really trying to argue your way and, and you know what you think is best. Maybe you were more a politician really trying to please the various people as you were working with. Maybe they were more of a manager or someone below you and you were really trying to find your way in an organization and meet the needs of everyone around you or there's preacher mode. So, you know, thinking about how to protect and promote the ideals that you have. Have you ever found yourself in one of these modes and have you worked your way out of it? Are you starting to rethink it maybe post this book or perhaps you've already been really, really open-minded and, and haven't really found yourself into these, but just curious where you guys land on these. I know um, for us, Kaylin and I, um, ever since we started EBCO, we're, we're here now in our eighth year, which is super exciting. And we've worked through some of these as well, just in terms of building the company. Like what, what do we argue for thinking the best versus really pulling it back and saying, you know what, what if we rethought this? What if we did something different? And so always challenging ourselves across how we're thinking and thinking with our teams is just something to reflect on. It's just as worthy as the conversations around innovation, around marketing and the processes internally is how are we thinking about these things in the first place? All right, I see some people really, okay, there, we have a lot of politicians in our audience today. <laughs> Oh, that's awesome. Um, some prosecutors. Good. Depends on the scenario. Love that. Yeah. So flip-flopping and getting into um, different zone. Hey, today we did try something different, by the way. You might notice the format allows you to unmute. So if you do want to raise your hand and talk to any of these things, um, there's no pressure, but we are totally open to that today. Um, that might be fun if anyone wants to speak to this. 
All right. Yeah, some great comments. And as Aaron echoed, if you want to raise your hand throughout, I saw some people on muted earlier, um, but feel free to raise your hand and we'll try to go through some of these comments. But I thought it was really interesting. Some of you that mentioned um, the type of company you work at and how maybe those same processes aren't applied to the business processes or that you know there is this kind of political need at a lot of organizations because you have to get other teams on board. You might have to get funding for a project. Um, and so that kind of lends itself to grouping more people in. So I think it's important to notice where that's collaboration-based or where it's more politician-based um, and thinking of, of how we can kind of be more innovative working around some of those va variables. So one thing that we noticed was this like focus again on how scientific thinking can aid innovation. And the author talks about how we celebrate entrepreneurship, entrepreneurs and leaders that are strong-minded and clear-sighted, decisive and certain. And what comes to mind is I always get like the Tony Robbins visual where his voice is like so booming. He's like, you have to do X. Like just that very like kind of alpha energy of like, this is where we're going. This is what we're doing. But research shows that sometimes the best strategists are those that are slow and unsure, um, really understanding the limits of our understanding. And that kind of goes to that concept of starting something out and realizing that even though you might be an expert or you might've worked on a category for 20 years, that there's the possibility that things are going to change or that we can't know possibly everything that's going on. And so how can we open our mind up to more limitless possibilities? The fact that there's new data that could come in, um, our favorite thing, obviously trends, um, but also that the category can evolve, the industry can evolve. So this is where being slower and unsure cannot be a weakness, but we can really become an asset for thinking about new solutions versus being more efficient um, and kind of thinking of everything more as like a fast process. So I thought that was an interesting juxtaposition to obviously agility and speed, but I think there's a way to bring those two together, but still being open to new ideas. So he talked about a study where entrepreneurs were in an incubator. They were split into two groups. So one group was motivated to look at it from a scientific lens. Um, they had a theory, they had customer interviews, they developed hypotheses, um, and then they would rigorously test and then measure the results of their prototypes to help make business decisions. The control group remained married to their ideas and didn't think theoretically about their products. And then the graph showed the difference that they made in financial performance over their first year. So you can see really uh, radical differences there in how that scientific thinking on their startup success led them to pivot to new business models, um, led them to obviously make a lot more money because they didn't see their ideas as sort of their creative passion that they were tied to, but more as an experiment of how to keep adjusting based on the new data that they were getting. Um, and we'll talk later on about that with forecasting how we have these long range projections, but we're still making those micro pivots, those pivots as we get new evidence, as we get new research um, and recognizing that things are gonna change, which is kind of in that concept of being, being okay with that level of uncertainty and knowing you're gonna have to adjust. So turning it around on ourselves again, what steps can you take to help you think more like a scientist? What are the possibilities for tweaking as you go? We know that the process and the results and the things that we do they don't go forever. They are not always the best. New technologies, new ideas, new people, new perspectives. These things are constantly coming. And so how can we think about our process and tweak as we go, think more like a scientist and apply that to our process as innovators and marketers? Let's see what some of you are sharing. Oh, okay. We're, we're still talking about some of the things that Marcus is bringing up in the chat, which I absolutely love. And this is about old structured thinking and the expectations that as experts and leaders in our industries, we have all the answers and that we are here to direct and execute. And it is absolutely a mind shift to think more like a scientist and think about the way we are achieving our results and tweaking as we go and adjusting this process. And we have to do this internally at all levels, especially from the top down, that it's acceptable to not know everything. And once we have that openness of not knowing the answer, it opens us up to literally endless possibilities of where we're headed in our category, in our industry, or even in our very micro projects that we're working on. That openness can lead us to places that might feel uncomfortable, might feel a bit risky, but also the most amazing outcomes that every organization, and in my personal opinion, should desire, you know, the big what's next. Trial and error, absolutely. 
Another theme that we saw was really around this like overconfident cycle that as we tend to advance in our careers or we get more experience, we tend to, you know, move in status. We start to think that we're experts at the space. We know everything. Um, I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've heard that on the other end that like our team knows all of this or our team is equipped to do all of this or we know everything about the category. And it's, it's like, how do we break that rethinking cycle? Um, how do we have that humility that we had as beginners that allows us to have a new approach? Um, when I played tennis way back in the day, and we actually have quite a few tennis players at EBCO, <laughs> um, we talk about this sometimes. And there's this thought that like, once you have your stroke pattern, it's really hard to adjust your stroke. It's almost like you have to start over again to be able to then like have a different forehand and have a different backhand grip. Um, and so there's this thought that it's really hard to retrain somebody that is already experienced versus someone that's brand new and you can actually do it correctly then. And so as we get more experienced and we have kind of this pride in our mastery, how do we continue to make progress? How do we stay open and curious where we used to be? If you ever heard about beginners starting something, it's that there's this na naivety in being a beginner that allows you oftentimes to rethink things and be more successful. Um, because you're so new to the category, you haven't heard no before a million times. You haven't had it beaten out of you at that point. And so how do we still stay open and curious and really not let kind of the weight of what we've heard before start to like bear down on us and allow us to get kind of overconfident in what we currently do? So I think this one's super interesting and, um, you know, kind of lends itself to thinking about lifelong learning or how do we bring in those inputs and how do we try new things and be open to that? There is also the upside of imposter syndrome. So think again, talks about the story of an Icelandic businesswoman that had no political experience who came in second for the presidential race um, as evidence of why imposter syndrome should be embraced, not ignored or wished away. Um, so this is often imposter syndrome is when you have doubts about something, you can view yourself as a learner, you can rework your strategy. Um, when you think you'll lose, why not try another way? Um, remembering creativity can come from anywhere. I thought this was interesting because especially in U.S. culture, um, a lot of it is about comp confidence. It's kind of like our ver version of Huga, right? It's like having confidence, um, asserting yourself um, is very much the work culture here. And so, but how can we flip that and think about having imposter syndrome and realizing that we are learners and that creativity can come literally from anywhere? Um, so having more uncertainty can actually prime us to ask questions and absorb new information for learning. So just a really interesting one to think about because um, culturally there's so many nuances. Like I've heard of tall poppy syndrome in Australia, there's imposter syndrome. There's just like all these different cultural nuances, but how do we bring some of those learnings in um, and think about innovation in a different lens? So here we're digging into the confidence sweet spot with this very illuminating diagram here. So across the top, we see believe in your tools, believe in your tools and then belief in yourself. And of course, we're aiming for confident humility. When we look at obsessive inferiority, this is a consuming feeling that occurs when we know how to do something, but we feel uncertain about our ability to execute it. When we look at debilitating doubt, this is when we lack conviction in our strengths or the strategies that we have in our toolkit. Blind arrogance down there on the bottom left, this happens when we are utterly convinced of our strengths and our strategies. And we have a total blind spot, blind confidence in our ability to be successful. And then the sweet spot down there on the right, having faith in our capability while appreciating that we might not have the right solution or we don't know what we don't know. And this is really what we should strive for, the bottom right, confident humility. And now looking at the rethinking mindset, there's no actual cycle to this mindset. You can pop in and out of it at any time this will occur whenever you are rethinking at different intervals, you might be in doubt, which is questioning what you do know. You could be in humility, which is know what you don't know, or curiosity, always seeking new perspectives and information. And the scientific way of thinking is stressing that it's totally okay to be wrong. We do not have to be dictators of our own thoughts. And just understanding this flow and feeling comfortable within it is a great space for us as innovators to be. All right, and a question for you all. What are common statements you tend to hear internally about knowing or being confident in current knowledge? Things about, we already know this internally, we are category leaders, we don't have to look there. What, 
what are some cultural sentiments that go around your in your organization internally that you're hearing about knowledge, about confidence? Feel free to share it in the chat. This is very analogous. This is very in line with the things that you guys have already been, been discussing. Yeah, and I'll read one that I thought was interesting. So Kumba says, it's about becoming aware of not defaulting to the same types of patterns every time, which I think speaks to like even how we make decisions, right? It's like sort of defaulting to our dominant decision mode and not realizing that we have that bias going into it or that we have a bias for certain decisions um, or certain ways of thinking. So that that's a really interesting one that might be like more subconscious that happens, but um, something that I've noticed a lot too as, as we've gotten more into this book is like, what's kind of your dominant thinking pattern or the way that you want to approach something and what's like the opposite of that or what's like a different way of doing it from a different team member um, and can get you to challenge your own thinking or your own like efficient approach to get there. And also I like um, Tammy's that there's never recognition that things have changed since then or we tried that already or like, yeah, that the world has changed so much since maybe like that last time we tried that product um, or trying to standardize the operation team um, while the innovation team is trying to disrupt. So yeah, some of those ten those classic tensions, right? Where innovation is always thinking about how to do something new and operations is how can we make this most effective um, and make this more of a process so that people can follow it as we like get new team members on or uh, the organization can better absorb ideas. So yeah, those are some of the classic tensions that um, I think have been around for decades now, but really interesting when we think of, of this space of rethinking, like how could operations be a partner? How could we have a process that allows for me more creativity, um, especially when we look at like Pixar's process as an example, they have a very creative process they go through, but it's very fluid. So how do you kind of rethink even how operations could be a better support? Um, could be an interesting one if, if we were almost to do like a project on that or rethink what that could look like. All right, so digging into part two now, rethinking categories, a few innovation stories and forecasting the future. Before we dig in too far, let's look at a book highlight. This is desirability bias. And this is something I'm guessing most of you are very familiar with. The desirability bias is the inclination to look for real world data that will confirm long held beliefs. This is when we have an idea or a hypothesis or something that we've always been doing. And we go out and we find the numbers or the anecdotes or the stories that basically confirm exactly what we want to hear. And when we do that, obviously we're putting on blinders immediately. And we know that there's a lot of issues with this right now. A hot topic is around politics, of course, and the way that our algorithms within our social spaces and our social fears are constantly feeding us information that make us feel like our perspectives are right. But when we pull this into the work environment and we're studying our categories or we're thinking about our pipeline for the next year and we're constantly saying, well, see, this is what the consumers are doing or here's the technology that's really leading the way. And we're constantly reading that same information. It's really hard for us to start looking in different areas and confirming our own bias is a liability. It puts blinders on us. It makes us potentially a fast follower once someone else sees something that we weren't even looking at. It's about looking around those corners, lifting up those rocks, getting to the top of the mountain and seeing the entire vista to be able to know what's really going on and get the right patterns and the right inputs so that we're not constantly confirming our own bias and our own path. And we might see this on happening with people that we're working with. And these are the things that we want to point out. Hey, have you thought about it from this perspective and thinking about how this can impact your own innovation process? And here it is. We see what we want to see and how does that impact innovation? So as an open question, thinking about in your organization, when someone comes to you with an idea and thinking about this loop of this is what we should be doing. And this is what, why, because this is what I heard. And this is what we should be doing because this is what I heard and on and on and on. And we can all understand how that would impact innovation, which relies on us to see things that others don't necessarily see that aren't outright right in front of us. Yeah. So another theme that we saw was around or another thing that we want to cover is innovation stories. So how do we scale out of the box thinking to think about our categories differently to really redefine consumer expectation? So we had some of our team members think about innovation stories that they've heard that demonstrate rethinking of a space or, or a category in different dimensions. So the first one we'll highlight is Bumble. So Bumble, if you're familiar with their story, um, so Whitney Wolf heard, I believe she worked at Tinder before she helped co-found it. 
And she ended up having to leave. Part of it was like due to relationship she had with the other co-founder. Um, but she kind of almost got chased out of that company. And so she left believing that there was an opportunity for a female focused audience um, where other dating apps were not targeting this um, and the women specifically. So she created one Bumble that allows um, women to make the first move. It also really focuses on women's safety and holding all users accountable for you know, having inappropriate behavior actions on the app. So she is kind of rethinking the, the dating app scene and, and what investors told her would be successful. So many investors turned her down um, and made her the youngest pioneer in the tech world at the time and the youngest woman CEO to take over a major company public at 31. So obviously wildly successful and based on her vision, um, but just goes to show kind of rethinking that space led to a whole like other new competitor to Tinder um, and a way of doing business. Weight Watchers. Um, so if you remember Weight Watchers from the past, they really started off with focusing on the scale. You had to weigh in, um, you had to measure your numbers. It was much more about accountability. Um, if you weren't doing the work, they might even ask you to not come to meetings anymore back in the day, but they really made a dramatic pivot that focuses on wellness that works. So they've moved into the digital space. They've started to look at health more holistically and thinking of chronic conditions that people might be going through. Um, they now are in packaging and food products. So they really reshifted their focus. They rethought their model and, you know, really kind of a, when you think about a business model that kind of felt outdated, they were able to stay more current and kind of survive in this overall wellness space. So it just goes to show some of those bigger pivots that can lead to success. Some other examples are, and that we've used some of these before, but they're so great. So Fenty, as an example, Rihanna was told that there wasn't a market for darker skin makeup um, and that it wouldn't sell and she wouldn't be able to make money off of it. But she thought, saw that a lot of brands did not highlight diversity very well, or that it was very limited, their perception of diversity. They might have like one dark shade in their entire lineup. So she created 50 different shades of foundation that appeal to women of all skin color. So you can literally find almost any, you know, one of those colors to match essentially, um, no matter what your skin tone is. And she's been wildly successful. Um, I mean, in the billions successful for this brand um, and for this approach has been really applauded. Third Love. So if you're familiar, they have a great website too. I'd really encourage you to check it out if you haven't heard of this brand, but they changed the lingerie space. So if you think of like Victoria's Secret, which has kind of this like very sexy proposition and um, and kind of intimate proposition. Third love thought about like real women and how boobs are all different. And you might, it might not be consistent. You might have two sizes. You might be a half size down. You might have a sloping shoulder where a strap falls off. So they thought of all the user pain points um, and developed this unique quiz where they can help create the right fit for you based on your needs. So they rethought the concept of bra shopping entirely to win with consumers. And then outdoor voices, they have this very Gen Z aesthetic. Um, they kind of took this why not approach to creating a lot of their products, like this exercise dress. They thought, why not? You know, people might not want to exercise in a dress, but maybe they do. Maybe it's hot out. Maybe they're playing tennis. So they just rethought some of those, um, some of the moments that their customer was looking to have to really start to create these viral product sensations that they launch online. So just showing that it doesn't have to be a serious athletic user. It can be somebody that is thinking of this as more of a hybrid lifestyle, but also thinking of the generational segment they're going after differently. Um, so just, these are all great examples of kind of rethinking and reframing and how these companies have found success where other companies have it. Um, Cause I can bet that Victoria's Secret had a conversation that went along the lines of, we can't have, you know, all these different bras for all these different consumers, how would we make money? You know, how would we stock that many bras inside of our store? How would we have that much of a merchandise assortment? Like we're doing fine selling cup sizes and, you know, now they have a competitor. So I think it just goes to show there's a different business model for almost anything um, and kind of tweaking and pivoting and like learning what works. So I, we could have had so many examples here, a whole other conversation, but lots of fun inspiration here. And on that note, Adam Grant himself brings us this brilliant quote, the solution is not to decelerate our thinking, it's to accelerate our rethinking. And you can reference this on page 29 of the book. The rest of the quote there was, that's what resurrected Apple from the brink of bankruptcy to become the world's most valuable company. So not 
stopping when you think all is lost, but using the power of rethinking to redirect and to take charge and be successful, just like the examples that Kaylin was giving us on that previous slide. So future forecasts, this is a theme that we want to hit on here. As innovation professionals, we're always striving to serve consumers with what they didn't know that they needed, but it's hard to predict the future. As trend strategists, as we look towards the future, we are always mapping and forecasting what we see coming, but we have to be comfortable that with a long range forecast, there is the potential to change direction. So we need inputs and we need to look at these signals on an ongoing basis. We must stay open-minded and flexible within the innovation process to take hold of this constantly changing and ever evolving world that we are in. I love, I love these examples because they're so um, synergistic with trend work, but we saw this theme around forecasting contests. So Think Again talks about competitions across the world where People try to predict the outcomes of major world elections, stock market performances, um, international sport competitions, and the best forecaster success was how often they updated their beliefs. The super forecaster, which I feel like I want that title now, um, they <laughs> updated their predictions more than four times per question. I thought that was so interesting. Um, and obviously he's talking about the context of a competition, but when we think of long range forecasting, how do we have a way to challenge our things that are happening as they're happening. I mean, a lot, no one could predict, well, I guess some people could have predicted, but a lot of companies didn't forecast that the, that there would be war going on, that inflation would be at this high of a rate. So how do we adjust maybe the trends that we were looking at, um, the initiatives that we have, how do we adjust that in the short term? Or is the goal to not adjust and to have those longer term outcomes, but then how do these macro drivers start to play into them? How do they accelerate or decelerate how do they, um, how do these new dynamics start to change the things that we're working on? Um, and even if I mean, we've seen even so much with technology shifting and really accelerating in a lot of spaces during COVID. So being able to be agile and adjust and understand that that's part of the process versus feeling frustrated that like, oh, why didn't we know this? And why didn't we have this in our forecast? And it's like, because it's changing constantly and there's new things coming up. So I thought that was super interesting that he highlighted that. One exercise that we like to do internally is mind mapping or fractal mapping, but mind mapping is something that can really jumpstart thinking of a space to really get us out of a linear thinking model or rigid thinking model, but also where you can start to find surprising connections or going deeper into adjacencies that can start to illuminate how could we think differently about the space we're currently in. Um, so you can see the mind map here was like strategies for whole food, plant-based living. So they have things like, you know, shopping. If you're shopping like fresh is best, stick to the edges, make your trolley a rainbow, um, supplements that you might want to stack together to have a better outcome, um, surviving social events, like eat before you go out, bring a healthy dish to share, restaurants looking at menus or talking to the chef. So you can start to see how this gets you to really analogous thinking. Like this could lead you to starting to create a map of all the restaurants that you could visit, or it could be eating by the rainbow and phytonutrients. Like what are phytonutrients? Like, could I research those and make a list of what I want to get into my diet every week? Um, could I start to think of a leftover system that I could utilize and new types of containers? So this could really get you very diverse in your thinking of every possible like scenario, adjacency, analog that you could think about to make yourself successful living a plant-based diet. Um, so we like to apply this to trends to start to think about what are those adjacencies? So when we do a category like beauty, we often, when we mind map, we're, we're drawn to supplements. We're drawn to what's happening in food and beverage. Let's list out all the trending ingredients right now to see where we're currently at. Um, and what are the outliers? Like, what are those exactly? And where do they teach us that something is headed? So this is a great process to go through if you're trying to diversify thinking, but almost how much your brain was already able to process about a space that just might be kind of in the recesses of your mind. Um, and then starting to even see your team's mind maps about that space and starting to challenge each other and think about, you know, what do we really not know about our space? Like we know everything about this part of it, but do we know about these 10 other things that we mind mapped? Um, so this can be a way to adjust thinking and also get it out on paper. But would love to hear if anyone has any practices that they have tried internally that they think has worked really well for either rethinking their space or um, looking at trends. And then while we're doing that, we're going to do a fun exercise right now. 
Um, so some of these might be relevant to categories you're working on. Some of these might not be, but um, it's fun kind of jumping into spaces maybe we don't know as much about too. So would love to talk about, so sustainability. Um, when we think of some of the trends that we currently see, we see things like plastic reduction, um, rethinking zero waste products, getting rid of secondary packaging, refillable business models, more circular systems. But what trends do you think could shift? Uh, I'm sure there's ones on here that you're thinking about if you're in any of these spaces, but what else could you learn? Like what might shift in here? Maybe, um, you know, there could be a big shift where all business models are refillable and then we can't have any plastic on shelf, or maybe it won't even be about plastic because they'll find out how to degrade it a lot faster. So what do you think could shift when you think of sustainability overall? Um, what else could you learn about this space? So I'd love to see your responses in the chat before we move on. Great, so circular manufacturing, components broken down and recycled at end of life. Yeah, I love that. So it could be the supply chain first um, or even thinking about how to deliver those materials differently. Plastic reduction will move from one-time use to longer-term plastics like apparel. I got super interesting and, and me and Sunshine actually had this conversation about how um, on another term, like how healthy are some of these plastic alternatives um, considering your body can absorb some of them that you're wearing. Um, so we had a whole conversation about like as we shift all these new materials, will people have questions about their health and their safety and like what your skin's actually able to absorb in a lot of these products? Or are there any byproducts suddenly from the new materials? Uh, more upcycling into new products. Yeah, I love that one. We talk about upcycling a lot. Looking at the energy consumed, see a lot of like carbon footprint scoring or neutrality scoring. Government sponsored shared economies. Yeah, I love that one. Like even rethinking like capitalism when it comes to buying so many products. Um, food waste prevention, sustainability via cost cutting. Um, I love this. Yeah, this, that's so great. So I think even there, we had a really good brainstorm. Um, so the other space would be plant-based. So uh, this one I, I could talk at nauseum about because I've read so much things lately about um, the cost of plant-based eating, but plant-based, so focusing on seeds, grains, nuts, we see a lot of that currently. And we see a lot of vegetarian or flexitarian preferences and talks about what do you traditionally see in a vegetarian diet that could be applied to like a more mass market product um, and bi biotech investment. So how can we reproduce a lot of this cheaper how can we start to rethink the food format? This one, I'll just kind of throw out mine here, is there's already sort of backlash against plant-based that's kind of very nascent so far, but it's kind of this thought of what are, is our body actually designed to eat? And are all these like chemo, these off toxins that plants produce, are they like actually healthy for us? Um, does it actually cause indigestion? And there's actually a lot of long-term vegans I've seen on Instagram start to talk about how they, real, they, they feel they ruined their gut lining. And so now they're going back to animal-based diets. And so there's been this like really interesting tension point bubbling up on how much plants are we actually supposed to eat and are actually some of these ingredients irritating. So I think for this one, I could see just some interesting like conversation around that continuing and maybe it shifts into more of this like hybrid, like this more neutral state of, of thinking of plants and animals more synergistically. Um, but you definitely still see a lot of this acceleration towards all these plant-based formats currently, um, but could see a pivot um, in the in the future. Someone mentioned lab-grown milk. Yeah, I love that one. There's some like lab-created ice creams now that we've seen tested. Um, regenerative agriculture, which um, I will say that's like a strong sentiment in Europe um, and thinking about how to produce that at scale. Um, Sunshine said so many long-term vegans that I know are all having gut digestion issues. That's the big, yeah, that's the big counter trend I see to plant-based dieting is, is people that now are having di dietary issues because of it. And they talk a lot about your body's ability to break down that much fiber over time. Vertical farming, um, which we start seeing that tested in warehouses now in places like Walmart, um, I think was rumored to have bought a bunch of warehousing space for vertical farming. So yeah, those are great. I mean, this one could be pretty a massive mind map just because um, so much going on in plant-based depending on what category you're in. Um, and the last one, virtual reality. So we have been really focused on, on things like Web3, Metaverse, um, 
but also thinking of this hybrid thing that might happen with digital shopping. So how are we having these online offline experiences? How are we purchasing things in the future from home? Um, and then we see a lot of VR currently in like fitness or business models like black box VR or entertainment business models. But what would the extension of that look like as you start to move towards more people having access to those types of devices um, and not using it in a more novelty way, but using it in a more like everyday life way. So thinking of even it being the future office or some of our team has met in the metaverse to have interviews um, and talk to each other and um, have team meetings. So lots of fun application. So ordering food in the metaverse, um, that would be really interesting if you could um, put on the VR goggles and go order um, and have it sent to your house. So even thinking here, we're starting to get into some scenario-based thinking that could stretch us to look at, are there other companies doing this? Are there any analogs for our category of how we could apply that? Um, because especially when you're thinking of something that is so far, relatively like long horizon, if it doesn't exist yet, how do we start to like rethink what could be possible in our own category versus just dismissing it um, or thinking of it as something that's not relevant to us today? Someone mentioned test drives for cars. That would be awesome. Interior design, grocery shopping, um, increasing digital products and reduced physical consumption. That's a really interesting one, um, especially when we think of like that even ties into the sustainability that we talked about earlier is, is there kind of this like increasing service nature to a lot of products versus um, having a one-off kind of physical product in person and grocery shopping. That would be really fun um, to do that and have it sent to your house. So yeah, these are great. And I think also, while we might not have gotten into today, it's like, what else could we learn? This could really start to bring in a lot of questions about the scenarios we produce or how there's a tie into our category. Is it an area worth investing in? So on that note, for our latest discussion question, what future forecasts for your category are you making and how can you stay open to new forecasts? Our chat has been blowing up today, so I'd love to see some responses to what future forecasts for your category are you making? Great, and while those are rolling in, I'm going to keep going just since we have 10 minutes left here. Um, Aaron, do you want to kick us off in this section? Yeah, rethinking the workplace, and this is bringing this whole thought into your organization. So rethinking is not just an individual skill. It's a collective capability and it depends heavily on an organization's culture. And now I'm going to dig into a few challenges organizations face around rethinking. Here's five for you to consider. One, teams operate within performance cultures that call for results, not new ideas. And please in the chat again, let me know which ones you identify with. Number two, employees feel limited or nervous to share new ideas that go against the grain Three, organizations hold on to the best practices too tight and don't make room for new ways of doing things. Number four, employees don't have the motivation from leadership to come up with new ideas. And number five, too much tunnel vision, not enough breadth or diversity of thought for new ideas. Internal to your organization now, or maybe somewhere where you worked before, what have you felt like you experienced of these five and numbers three through five, we are going to tackle them throughout the rest of this presentation, dig a little bit deeper. Um, but yes, all of these should be familiar to some of you, whether it's where you work now or other teams you've been on in the past. These are some of the challenges that we face around rethinking. So the first theme that we saw was this idea of challenge networks, this idea of having colleagues, having a team, having other leaders who could challenge ideas um, and how that, while it doesn't always sound appealing sometimes socially, it might actually be the best thing for us to point out blind spots, to help overcome weaknesses. How do we activate our rethinking cycle and understand if we are open to actually rethinking? And this might come in the form if you've ever had anybody challenge your idea and at first, like you're not open to it. You're kind of like, what are they talking about? And then it soaks in a little bit later and you're like, oh yeah, like that actually, wait, maybe it could work. Maybe there is a different way of, of doing this or thinking about it. So we find that, or in the book, he mentions that business leaders find success is by having a vision and thinking outside the box. 
Um, research shows that when highly praised CEOs hit roadblocks in their businesses, they got overconfident. They didn't want to change their original strategy. This study shows that we want people who affirm our conclusions, not those that challenge and suggest different courses of actions. Adam says he's watched too many leaders shield themselves from task conflict. As they gain power, they tune out boat rockers and listen to bootlickers. So just this idea that there's a lot of societal norms about being agreeable um, and kind of just going along with the flow, but is that really what's best for the business? Is it really going to move us forward faster? We also have this societal aversion to criticism that we have to work against, um, is that one experiment shows that when workers were criticized rather than praised by their partners, the workers were over four times more likely to request a new partner. It was shown that employees' default response is to avoid coworkers who criticize them and sometimes drop them altogether from their networks. Um, following the split from critical partners, their performance suffered. So what happens when we don't silence our critics? How does it impact our work and our creativity? Um, so thinking of how, you know, we know this is going to, this is going to be a societal aversion. So how do we think about delivering criticism or new ways of thinking in a way that people are going to receive them, but also be open to it ourselves when we experience it in reverse. So he says that challenge kind of accepted that arguing is a good thing. So we can give us a new perspective on uh, an issue. Um, respectful arguments they found, even when parents argue in front of their children, as long as it's respectfully it doesn't have a lot, huge bearing on children's academic, social, or emotional development. So that was kind of just an interesting um, stat. Being more creative, so it can allow us to flex our creative muscles. A uh, study showed that architects that come from homes that didn't shy away from conflict were actually more creative. Um, and this idea of a shared goal. So if the shared goal is excellence, or the shared goal is the most awesome products ever, or the most you know fun beverages, or the most innovative cars, whatever it might be that the organization has as its culture, arguments can be made good in the pursuit of reaching that common goal. So I love this one because of the Pixar tie-in here is that their common goals is an excellent movie. It's the most create most creativity you can find um, in kids' movies. And their goal is to produce that award-winning experience for kids and their parents and to have that feeling of success when they reach that other side versus having a subpar movie that maybe only everyone just sort of agreed with and went with it. So I love there, there's is a whole creative process to really dig into, but they do have these like arguments and these like shared goals that they talk about. And that's why they're so open and receptive to, to thinking and taking a different perspective. So a discussion mm -hmm. question here would be who's in your challenge network or is there a way to kind of bring this to life internally? And as you think about that, we'll dig into this theme of learning cultures. Adam Grant said, rethinking is more likely to happen in a learning culture where growth is the core value and rethinking cycles are routine. And this is because evidence shows that in learning cultures, organizations innovate more. They make fewer mistakes. People are okay to not feel constrained by limitations presented by performance, which is always hitting numbers. And what is the ROI of everything, but actually feeling more expansive to come up with ideas and learn and stay curious. So in the book, we talk a lot about downsides of performance culture, where if results are the only thing that's prioritized, it sometimes encourages you to conform. You have to please authority. You have to self-limit and stay in your lane. And if you deviate, you run the risk of, of backlash. So talking about how this can sometimes be an enemy of rethinking or of wanting to do things differently. And then also this idea of psychological safety. So psychological safety and security is vital in the workplace. And by modeling openness, vulnerability, inclusiveness, leaders can start to create this safety for their teams. Um, so it can lead to employees challenging the status quo without being punished or fear of any kind of punitive, da punitive damages or challenges. So this one, I think, is really interesting. We think of some of the practices we talked about earlier around maybe having a safe space for arguments or talking about rethinking an approach to a project and being open to everyone's opinion at that point. Um, so some really interesting learnings on, on, on how we can bring that to life. We'll send these just due to the time, we'll kind of send this deck over so you can read some of these case studies, but Microsoft did um, ask me anything, coffee chats where they had honest dialogue about their company. Um, we've also seen how you can see if you have psychological safety and when you don't. Um, so just something to kind of look at to see if that exists in the team and how we can bring that to life. Also, this idea of 
of trying something new. So um, in performance cultures, there's an emphasis on ideas having to be successful, but how do we have ideas that don't have to be successful? Is there a way to have more creativity um, and not requiring proof, but maybe more requiring like rigor of idea or how, what was the creative process to get to the idea is different than requiring or proving that it has to be successful. So think again is at Amazon where decisions are informed by six page memos that lay out the problem, different approaches that have been considered and how the solutions might serve the customer. Um, so they use rigor, creativity, and thoroughness versus proving that something's going to work before they've even tried it. And the last one here is seeking better practices of how to bring like rethinking to life um, and how to bring that to life in the organization. So we'll send this over since we had to go a little faster through this section um, on at the end. Yeah, thank you everyone so much for joining. Quick conclusion that by accelerating rethinking, we discover white spaces for innovation. And as most of you know, because you are here, this is exactly what EBCO does. So if you feel like there is anything that you want to come to us and help us rethink with you, reframe some of those challenges that you are working on, tackle your innovation programs, this is where our expertise lies and we absolutely love it. Thank you so much for everyone who was so engaged in the chat. We do all sorts of things and we have some upcoming super fun things, our signature programs webinar and our theme for next quarter is play. This will impact our webinars, our next book club, all of the fun, fun things that we have going on. And I see lots of you talking about that this went by super fast. I'm glad that we could help accelerate your day with some inspiration. As always, we are here for you. Erin um, at theebco.com, Kaylin at theebco.com, Andrew at theebco.com, reach out to us. We would love to talk with any and all of you and good luck in your rethinking as you go back to tackle all of the juicy goodness that you tackle every single day on your innovation projects. And thank you so much for joining us.